Once upon a time, there was a distant planet in a far-flung corner of the galaxy. A boisterous and chatty little species came into being there one day and immediately thrived, to the extent that there were around six billion of them by the early 21st century. This species decided to call itself humans. The humans shared the resources of this planet they called Earth as best they could. Which wasn't very well, to tell you the truth. Because out of that total of 6 billion, 850 million humans suffered from severe undernourishment. 850 million means more than one human in seven. So maybe you're wondering how they decided who among them should be well-fed and who should be undernourished. They didn't hold a contest, nor a prize draw. It pretty much depended on where you were born. Out of the 850 million underfed humans, 820 million lived in the southern part of the planet. But what does undernourished or underfed actually mean? For example, let's take two young humans. Bob lives in a region in the north of the planet called Europe, while Seku lives in a southern zone called Africa. Their food intake is very different in terms of both quantity and quality. Whereas Bob has access to a very diet and plenty of it, Seku is underfed. Most of the time he eats rice or millet, little in the way of fruit and vegetables, hardly any meat or dairy products. His diet doesn't cover all his needs in terms of energy, nutrients, vitamins and minerals. He is exposed to serious health risks and statistically speaking, will die 20 years younger than Bob. How did such an injustice come about? It's important to remember that these creatures are unable to absorb solar energy directly. Meaning they have to store up energy by swallowing plants and animals grown and raised by a particular category of human called farmers. Yet, along with their families, farmers represent 80% of the undernourished population. There are several reasons for this paradox, and they sometimes overlap. In certain regions of the planet, farmers only have tiny plots of land, which are too small to feed their families. In other regions, they don't even own the plot of land they use to grow crops. In the four corners of the world, poor peasant farmers do not enjoy access to the latest techniques nor equipment, which could help them produce more and store their harvest to make it last all year. There are also some countries which have a wealth of natural resources such as oil and where food production is insufficient due to a shortage of farmers. Let's see why. The field of manioc you can see here has been abandoned because its owner Usman has gone to live in the big city. Usman left because he hopes he can earn more money working in the oil industry. He no longer produces manioc and nor does he consume much anymore. Since he became a city dweller, he prefers bread made from wheat or rice. But wheat and rice don't hardly grow in this part of the planet, which means they have to be bought elsewhere, on the international market. This is where Peter comes in. Peter is a trader in Chicago. Peter's job is precisely the buying and selling of agricultural products. He's never actually seen a sack of rice. Everything is done on computer. When he buys a product, its price goes up, and when he stops buying, its price falls. This is Seku, Usman's former neighbour who stayed behind in the village. Seku no longer eats manioc, but rice. Since imported rice has become really cheap, it makes more sense financially to grow cotton for export and then use the money to buy rice. The result is that Usman and Seku are both dependent on Peter for their food. And then one fine day, Peter and his friends decide that wheat is wonderful. But cotton leaves them cold. As a result, the price of wheat goes through the roof, taking rice with it. Usman and Seku no longer have the means to buy their main source of food. Their survival depends on imports. This is known as food dependency. Luckily, there's Josephine. Josephine works for a food aid program which distributes provisions to Usman and Seku to stop them starving, which is obviously a good thing. What's not so good is that distribution of free food pushes down prices on the local markets, which makes Seku even poorer. 
Alberto is a demographer. His job is to predict future population trends. Now, according to Alberto, countries which are subject to food dependency are those whose population is set to grow fastest in the coming decades. The current shortage of food is caused by poor distribution, not sharing it out properly. But feeding everyone in 2050 will require the world's food production to be doubled. To attain this goal, the most obvious solution is to increase the cultivated land area. But Earth is a small planet, and three quarters of its surface is ocean, so space is limited. Hence the second solution, increasing the yield. In other words, the quantity produced on a given area. Farmers in northern countries have become really good at this kind of thing. On an identical land surface, Michel, a farmer in Europe, produces up to 1,000 times what Seku can achieve in Africa. The problem is that this exploit consumes water, oil, fertilizers and pesticides and is highly polluted. Miriam is an agronomist. Her job is to think about agriculture and she tells it straight. We've got to come up with a new type of agriculture, enabling us to produce more and better. But how? For example, by using organic products which are not so harmful for the environment. By using crop rotation. By going back to local plants which are more suited to the soil and climate. By combining complementary plants using watering techniques which save on water. But to access all of these techniques and own the land they work on, farmers in southern countries require financial resources. And on Earth, financial resources are usually located in the northern countries. This means that these countries have a heavy responsibility. Rather than sending their stocks of cereal or milk to the poorest countries in massive quantities, they should help them develop their own food production and its distribution on a local scale. Humans have an old proverb. Give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Give him a fishing rod and he will eat for a lifetime. So, how can we feed all the inhabitants of this distant planet? You might be thinking, that's their problem. And in a way, you're right. But try to put yourself in the shoes of one of these creatures. Let's say an inhabitant of one of the rich countries. Let's say Bob. What can you do? You don't even know Seku. You can't lend him your pocket money. However, you hold, uh, I mean, Bob holds, a small part of the solution. Here's how. In rich countries, and those where living standards are rising, the same type of diet is spreading. Despite the cultural differences, everyone is eating fewer cereals and pulses, beans, etc. And a lot more meat, fish and dairy products. And that changes everything because you need three kilos of grain to produce one kilo of poultry, and more than double that to obtain one kilo of beef. This is where Bob can make a real difference. In fact, by choosing a dish of lentils instead of steak, he consumes one-sixth of the farming land and one-twelfth of the water, and this leaves more for others. So, how can we feed the world? It's tricky, as the factors at work are political, economic, ecological and scientific. On this distant planet, humans have to work together to solve this puzzle. And unless they find a spare planet to rear cows on, the solution also lies in changing their eating habits. In other words, in changing what's on Bob's plate. <laughs>